the development presentations. And although I was looking at some of their portfolios and they say project on it, I really hate that word project when it comes to this because it's what it really is is hopefully the solution to a problem. So the way we look at it is students are going to investigate a problem to solve. It's of their own choosing. And it could go anywhere. Um, that thing was a problem about 20 years ago. Okay? Um, we've had, you see all the instruments up here. Uh, we built instruments for a manufacturer in Elberts that used carbon fiber. And so that was a problem one year. Um, we've had people build robotic devices. I haven't seen anywhere yet. There's on the outside if you like to. Um, so there's, it, it's about trying to identify and solve a problem and not just build something. Because, um, you know, building something is a good thing, but really trying to figure out how to solve that problem is uh, what we're all about. So what we're going to take you through is uh, Seamus is first. Then Alex, oh, oh, sorry, Lily, Alex, yeah, okay. Um, so the format is they get approximately 20 minutes to present, and then you get at most 10 minutes to torture them with questions, okay? Uh, if there's no questions, we'll move on to the next presenter. If you go too long, I'll pull you off of the hook and we'll, we'll move on to the next one. Um, and, um, uh, ask, ask whatever you want. Um, they'll tell you whether they want you to ask questions at the end or if it's okay in the middle or whatever. And uh, I'm going to have them introduce themselves and a little bit about what they, what they are going to do in the future and uh, we'll do the presentation. So everybody's ready? Seamus. Hello, my name is Seamus Fogarty, and tonight I will be presenting my solution to my problem, which is to clean paintbrushes effectively and efficiently in an art classroom setting while reducing the amount of damage that is done to them because of poor cleaning practices. Here's my table of contents. So this is what you'll see in my presentation tonight. And at the very end, I advise everybody to think of any questions you might have during this presentation and ask me in the very end. So within my design brief, I have a problem statement. And that is that artists have a hard time cleaning paint brushes in a timely manner, along with getting all the paint residue out of the bristles. And after they're done with cleaning those brushes, they have a hard time finding methods of drying them without actually damaging the bristles. That results in even more damage of the paint brush. Yeah. So I had to find out if it was a problem. So I talked to both of our, our teachers here at the high school, Mrs. Hale and Ms. Texera. Both said that the brushes that are in their rooms don't get cleaned enough. Students don't have enough time at the end of class to clean all the brushes that have accumulated over the whole class period. And when they're done cleaning them incorrectly, they often place them upside down. So in Mrs. Hale's terms, the heads of the brushes get squashed and they get damaged. I also researched how exactly paintbrushes cause a problem in an environmental standpoint. And I found out that 300 million paintbrushes are thrown away each year within Canada and the United States. And some people might think that washing paintbrushes aren't that fun. And they're almost as easy to throw away as Kleenex. Within my des design brief, I needed a client. So I came up with any retail store, art and craft store they can find. That includes the Michaels, an AC Moore, or a Hobby Lobby, where you can find your school supplies or arts and craft supplies. 
My target consumer is any freelance artist that specializes in water-based painting, which is a part of my criteria within my design group to test specifically on water-based water -based paint only. And another target consumer would be an art teacher within a school or an art studio. Designer. My professional, Donald T. Mims. He's a civil engineer at Bergman Hydroelectric. We've been conversing these past couple of months via Gmail on how I can design and critique some things about my materials within my paintbrush cleaner. And he's mentioned to look into a paint roller spinner that can be hooked up to a water spigot or a faucet where the water circulates and cleans the paint roller, kind of similar to a drink brush cleaner, which you'll see in a sec. Then I found some Amazon ratings where it was five stars for easy to use and 3.3 for the value of money. So more about my professional's response and some questions. And we were talking about some of the root causes in my tests, like my flow tests, my street tests, if all the paintbrushes were placed in the same port, if I could also add a flow test to my final design and increase the flow of water to see how my product would react. Here's my cleaning test number one. I used red acrylic water-based paint, and I also labeled my paintbrushes from one through six. And here's my PVC hooked up to a faucet to give you a visual. And while testing, I needed to find a way how I would collect quantitative data. So I had to experiment with different testing sensors slash templates on how exactly I would gain that qualitative data and to prove for support that my paintbrush cleaner can actually clean paintbrushes in a timely manner. For part of my constraints, I needed the paintbrushes to clean within two minutes. So I made each street boss in 20 second increments. And the four is the paint and the water. Those are going to be my control variables. Here's the unsuccessful template versus the successful template. And with the unsuccessful template, there's obviously more paint streaks. That means it would only show 30. And the successful template was a little bit better, where it was able to clean the paintbrush more effectively. Here's my brush placement inside the PPC, which answers my professional's question if all the paintbrushes are in the same port. As you can see, they are number one through six. Here are the first results to my first test. You might say that you didn't clean all the brushes, which it didn't, so I had to find out why it didn't. And here's the data that was collected and some graphs that I made. a little video clip of my insert part tilted. So one of the root causes I came up with for my strict test was that for the first test, my insert part wasn't adjusted correctly and that it was slightly tilted. But as you can see, the image of my insert part has some paint residue on the sides and that provides evidence that the paintbrushes were cleaning during the cleaning test. My cleaning test number two. For this one, I use green acrylic water-based paint. For a video, okay, running through real quick. As you 
as you can see, the water is flowing out from the bottom like it's supposed to. So my test two results, all the brushes were able to be cleaned in a timely manner. And what I did differently this time is I repositioned my insert part so that the brushes weren't near the drainage holes for the paint to wash out of the mechanism. I also switched out brush number three and number four because I found out that having more damaged bristles actually results into a harder brush to clean. And here's the data that's collected in the graphs that I made. So after I came up with my final prototype, I had to see if it was simple to use and simple to test. So I grabbed one of Mrs. Hill's R students from her class and to give it a shot. And as you can see here, they got very good results all around. All the brushes were able to be cleaned in a timely manner. And she used a darker color to see if it was either easier or harder to clean. Here's the data collected in the graphs that go with it. So at the very end of all six tests that I've conducted on my paintbrush camera, I made some test stats. Calculated the average of paint, the length of paint streaks, and the average length of water streaks, along with making a graph, as you can see over here. The longer the brushes went through the cleaning cycle, the closer they got to making the five inch clear streaks. I also calculated about what time the paintbrush is starting making the five inch clear streaks. And as you can see from my test one through six, I have obviously different results. And at the very end, I have a little longer than usual because I used an oil water-based paint as my final test to see if it paint, and it did. So design process slash critiques. Here's my first version of my first one. And so I had to cut it down because it was a little bit too bulky, a little bit too much material that made the part. So this is it hooked up to the sink. And it's not that great because a lot of the water was flowing through. So I made a second version of my part one, a first version of my part two. And to get a visual of how they connect, Here's both of the parts kind of sandwiched together into the sink. I also had to make an insert part to see how exactly the water was going to circulate around the product and to see how the water would behave inside the paintbrush cleaner to clean each brush individually. My prototype number one, I made a second versions for all three of my main parts here, and I made the first version up of my slider parts. Here's a visual of my first prototype on the table and hooked up to the sink. And the slider parts are for to hold all the parts together while either out of the sink or hooked up to the sink. Here's an observation test. The water pump is My prototype number two, I made three versions of all three of my main parts and a second version of my slider parts. And here's an observation test of the high water pressure. As you can see there, that's kind of sliding out, that's overflowing, not so great. And so coming back to my professional, to the question, if I could add a high water pressure test to see how my mechanism would react. And it wasn't able to withstand the intensity of the flow of the water entering into the mechanism because the slider parts popped out and it was overflowing. Oh, 
part of my criteria was that I needed to create a dry rack to hold all six brushes. So here's my paintbrush cleaner holders, and they're a little bit tilted, so I came up with a new method of holding my paintbrushes vertically so the brushes would be able to dry all the way without hitting the flat surface of the table or the counter, to which would result in deformation of the bristles and the loss of the bristles. Full assembly with and without brushes. And prototype number two, full assembly, top view and a side view. Some things that are good about my design, the entry of both of the brushes, I felt were a nice touch in the sense that I wanted to make this product kind of universal to all water-based paint brushes so teachers and educators can use for their classes. The drying rack to enable the brushes to dry after the cleaning test. The body of the product that makes it look it belongs in an art class setting. The legs on the bottom of the PVC that allows the mechanism to be raised off of the sink surface to let the water drain out of the products and get that paint residue and contamination out. Some things that could be changed about the design, the slider parts obviously weren't so great because of the high water pressure test they popped out of the PVC. Smaller screws for the drying rack, I picked some big screws and the size of the hole that in the middle of my paintbrush cleaner. If I shrunk the diameter just a little bit, I would be able to use like braided vinyl tubing that I feel would be more effective than what I decided to use, which is an elephant tr trunk attachment adjuster, which enabled me to test my product in different sink settings that differentiate in sink height. So the cost of my Prototype number one came out to be $9.68 worth of material that I used to make my parts. And I decided to use ABS 3 filament because it's really good at rapid prototyping uh, my designs when I needed to. And it's able to withstand immediate hot or cold temperatures of water within short periods of time. And here's the cost of my prototype number two. That came out to $9.27 worth of material used to make my uh, parts. And a couple of other things that I used off the side for my final product that came out to be $33.90. And some of my research, I had to look at different brush heads to in order the universal use of my product. I searched up you know, past B scale to give myself a little bit of inspiration of how I would be collecting quantitative data. I also looked up paintbrush holders and racks to figure out ways how I would design the circular drying rack on my paintbrush cleaner. And here's an image of a paintbrush tub that I got out of our art room. So I could make it really resemble that it's supposed to kind of fit within the art setting width and a container, which gave me an idea for my part one and part two, how they would connect together and stay secure while they're going through the cleaning test. Any questions? Yes. First of all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is, when you were speaking to the art teachers, did you get an idea of how much cost um, right now they go, like when they go through paintbrushes that are become unusable from not being cleaned? properly. Did you get an idea of what that is costing them per year? Uh, I didn't get an idea of how much it exactly costed for them. Uh -huh. They were kind of left in a loop where 
they have to use damaged paintbrushes oh. because they use so many and they have so many students every single year. So they can't really continue to replace and replace paintbrushes every single year. Right. So I definitely imagine that it would be really expensive. Thank you. Seamus, can you take a minute and show us how yeah, the water flow? Give us, give us the go around that now. So I know I did, and I showed some videos on how the water kind of flowed through. But here's a closer look. So the water is going to come into here of this coupling, and then into this. This is made out of a one-inch PVC pipe and parts that I cut out of a canister vacuum that would then flow into my mechanism. If I take the out like so, the water goes in the middle, and as it goes into the middle, as you can see, there's holes along the walls of it, so it pulls up into the middle, and then it shoots out the water from the sides, which then gently hits the bristles and creates a more proper way of cleaning paintbrushes than a direct flow of water, which is a little bit too rough than your standard water-based paintbrushes. And after that, the contaminated water flows into these two drainage holes, which then go into my part two, and it pulls up into the middle, goes in through these four drainage holes, and the little lights that I talked about earlier that raise the PVC off of the floor of the sink allows for the contaminated water to drain out and into the sink drainage and you know, this is just another problem I just thought of, but you don't have to worry about like a splatter of paint to go all over the sink and then clean the sink separately after you're done cleaning the paintbrushes. So, yeah. Yes. Did you consider using soap? Did you consider the flow of the water, like the water consumption? And also, is it a viable product? I mean, could you could you make and sell it? So to answer your first question, I did not use soap only because I wanted to see how effective it would be without soap to not give it another variable, so an advantage. And yeah, I think it did pretty well without using soap. Uh, to answer your question about the consideration of the flow of the water pulling into the mechanism. I did consider that. I actually did calculate uh, gallons per minute of the sinks, and I did that with a 30 ounce deli container. <laughs> um, and it came out to be 0 0.63 GPM. So it's not quite fast of a flow rate that I thought, but it's definitely something that some a user would definitely have to keep in mind to not crank the faucet all the way, so it would have to cool up. And in terms of actually manufacturing this product, I've thought of having it, you know, injection molded if it was going to go through the manufacturing process, but that would actually cost hundreds of thousands of dollars because of the complexity of the design. Um, have to sell a lot. Yeah, you just have to sell a lot of them, and somehow you'll you'll reach that point, <laughs> make your revenue. So you you did talk to some people at Tesla about injection molding. I, I I did contact them. None of them got back to me, but I did do separate research on the specifics of 3D uh, polymer injection molds. It's still really expensive, <laughs> either way. I think you're off the hook. Thanks, Shana.
there? Yes, Jesus. Uh, the laser pointer is there. So one of the things I, I told them was the show goes on no matter what. Yeah. So I made everybody nervous because, um, so that metal sculpture up there was done I think 20 years ago from a student and as she was doing her presentation, we lost power. Everything went down. She did the whole thing without. Me. So I just changed it. So. Um, okay, now we're good. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm Lily Yango. I'm um, going to RIT next year for mechanical engineering. And I created the flip form, which is this guy right here. Um, so today I'm going to walk through my design brief, my research process, my design process, and how I tested it. Um, starting with my design brief. My problem statement was water meter or plants can get difficult when you have many different kinds of plants that need different amounts of water at different rates. I personally fall victim to this. I love house plants and have far too many in my room and forget to walk them all the time. So I am creating a product to hopefully help me fix that. Um, my design statement. I wanted to design, prototype, and test a device that waters plants based on the average water needs of that type of plant and shows growth based on the average length of the leaves. Um, I'll get into more of what this means uh, when I go and test it, but I really just wanted it to be planted a lot. Uh, criteria constraints. Um, I had a lot of ideas of what I wanted this to be. Um, I wanted it to be for indoor use. I didn't want it to go outside. Um, I wanted it to be, not be over 20 decibels. Honestly, I wanted it to be quiet. I didn't want it to make noises, hum. I hate it when things buzz, so I did not want this to make noise. Um, it had to be able to handle one to five plants. And I created a, a design that holds one plant right now, but it's very easy to multiply it and um, make it hold up to five plants. Um, I wanted to rank above a four on an aesthetic test. This was honestly one of the hardest things to do, um, just because people's opinions on how pretty something looks is very, very subjective. Um, so, but I wanted it to be pretty. I wanted it to be something that people wanted to put in their homes and wasn't disgusting. Um, and then it, well, I wanted it to take up less than three square feet of floor space. I didn't want it to be huge and take up a lot of things. Um, I wanted it to be assembled in 10 minutes. I didn't want finished parts that would have to be messed up or fixed. And the biggest thing was I didn't want it to require maintenance more than once every two weeks. I feel like it can handle fixing it once every two weeks, but I didn't want to do more than that. So my target consumer, the people that would buy my product, would be people with indoor houseplants. Pretty much anyone with an indoor houseplant. Um, so I would sell the product to plant nurseries, places like Lowe's, um, Ace Hardware, Home Depot, things like that, where people go to buy things with and I am obviously a designer. That's me welding the base. Um, this tail took that picture, it's super cool. Also, my outfit is amazing. We have to wear these leather jacket things when we weld, and the smallest one is a medium, and I am not a medium, very small. So I'm drowning in it, but it's awesome. <laughs> so before I had to start, I had to do some research. Uh, I need to prove that this is a problem for other people. I didn't want the clientele to be me. Um, so I ran a survey. The first question on the survey was, do you have indoor plants? Uh, about 86% of people said they did, which was honestly more than I was expecting. But 86% of people said that they did. Um, and then the next question, have you ever forgot to water them? Um, fewer people uh, had, but 71% of people said that they had forgot to water plants. Um, would you buy a product that watered plants for you? 87% um, or 86% of people said that they would, uh, they would buy a product like that. And then the last question, uh, how much would you spend on a product like this? I wanted to, uh, to use this question as kind of a budget for me, just so I wouldn't spend so much that people wouldn't be willing to pay for it. 
Um, so the average of all of their answers was about $9.51. So I, I kind of thought that's my budget for this product. Now, plant research. Um, there are types of self-watering systems out there, and they basically fall down, fall into two categories. Capillary, like this picture on top, and stick, like this picture on bottom. Capillary uses capillary action of water, that's like cohesion and adhesion, it's a lot of biology. Um, so water comes from the bottom and up into the plant. And stick, you fill this bowl with water and it like drains into the plant. Um, so like one goes from bottom to top, the other goes from top to bottom. I did a lot of research and I went from a top to bottom uh, system, uh, and we'll get into black. Uh, then I came across this term, thigmomorphogenesis. I had to look up how to pronounce that. Um, and thigma means touch, so it's basically how plants respond to stimulus. Um, it's similar to when you work out, uh, you're lifting weights, and you're actually making little tiny tears in all of your muscles. And then when you sleep, um, all of your uh, cells fix all of those little tears, and you get stronger muscles because of it. Um, it's a very similar process in plants. Any physical disturbance makes the stem cells shorter and stronger. Um, so rain, wind, uh, animals walking by, other plants touching it, all of those things add a physical stimulus that makes uh, the stems stronger. This is a really common thing in indoor plants. Uh, a lot of them become like spindly and slightly weak because they, there is no physical stimulus inside. There's no wind, nothing really touches it, it just sits. Um, so I wanted to incorporate that uh, process into my uh, design, which is why I chose a more down, top-down method because I wanted it to uh, physically stimulate the plant. Um, for this, I needed some experts because I do not know everything about plants. So I first contacted Kate Ward. She works at Dickman Farms. She's been there for 20 years, um, and she has a biology degree from Alfred. She was super helpful and got me in touch with uh, Jack Birdmaster, uh, and he works with Earth Planter, which is actually the company that makes these planters up here. Um, and he was really helpful. Um, I ended up going in a different direction, obviously, um, but I figured he was worth mentioning because he was really helpful. Um, but Kate Ward is my official expert. Um, now I had to create a, a product, which was the difficult part. Uh, so my version one is right here. This is a 3D printed cloud. The black cloud kind of became ominous after a while because this did not work. Um, it's 3D printed, so uh, a machine goes and creates very small lines back and forth. So it created a really porous bottom. Um, as you can see, I was like blowing onto the top hole here, and all of these little things are bubbles, just because it wasn't airtight. It, um, yeah, it just stripped everywhere. As you can see, it was stripping outside everywhere. Um, there's actually four holes on the bottom, and I wanted the water to drip through there, but it's actually just dripping everywhere. Uh, super annoying. Um, then I was doing some research on uh, drip irrigation systems, and a lot of those use um, a pressure differential in between the container um, to slow down the drips. So I created a lid for it right here. The, that's a paper towel, just so you can see where the lid is, because it's black on black, it's hard to tell. Um, but the pressure differential maybe helped a little bit, but it's really hard to tell, because again, the whole design didn't really work that well. So then I came up with version two, which is my plant form. Uh, so there are four main parts of this. There's the candy cane, uh, the container, the uh, platform, and the base right here. I made up little names because it's easier to talk about. So the candy cane, I actually bent it with my bare hands, which is super awesome. I used the little mechanical advantage, but that's not important. Um, and then the container is actually a gelato container, but um, when I go into it, I'll uh, explain why. Uh, and it has a hook on the top, that connects to a hole that I drilled into the candy cane, and then it has uh, two holes on the bottom. Um, so the idea is you put water in, and it slowly drips out. Um, and because this is mostly sealed, it drips out pretty slowly. Um, and then this is just uh, a CNC machine, like milled it, and it just stays there. And then the base is I welded it myself and cut it all out. It's not great welding, but again, we'll actually come back to that one. So I had a product, now I needed to test it. Um, I decided to use spider plants um, for my test subjects. They show symptoms very easily. Um, when they're dehydrated, their leaves get all gray and uh, wilted. Um, 
but then when they're rehydrated, they perk right back up. So I wanted it to show symptoms quickly so I could know if it's working or not easily. Um, and then they're also really easy to propagate. I have the spider plant at home, and all of these little green things on the bottom are like spider babies. You just uh, trim them and put them in water, and they root very quickly. Um, so they were easy to propagate and show symptoms quickly, so they were the perfect test subject. Um, for my procedure, I really just wanted the platform, plant form to keep them alive for two weeks. Um, so I assembled my platform. Uh, I filled up the container with enough water for about two weeks. I used three tablespoons for a spider plant. Um, set the product in a place with good light where it won't be heavily disturbed and let it run. I checked in daily to observe the plant health. Um, way back in my design, uh, design uh, statement, I said I wanted to measure it based on average leaf, uh, leaf growth. So I measured all of the leaves, took the average um, every day. Um, so the results. It did keep the plant alive, but that's kind of where it stopped being great. Um, it needed to be re refilled after a week. Um, I think why is just the holes in the bottom are a little bit too big, or maybe the holes on the top are a little bit too big. If you don't have anything on top, then it creates a vacuum, and then nothing will drip out. So um, I drilled two holes to just put this hook in, and I think it was a little bit too big and let a little bit too much water in or air in, so more water went out. Um, but it did stimulate the plant. The water dripped on top, um, so. That is pretty hard to measure the stem cell uh, size, but it did stimulate the plant. Granted, you can make a watering can do that. So in the end, I made a really cool watering can. Um, I wish it were better. <laughs> so I showed this to my expert. Oh no, I did. I first had to do an aesthetic test um, because another one of my criteria was I wanted it to be pretty. Um, so I ran another survey. Um, would you put this product in your home? Was the first question. Um, uh, it's hard to see all the numbers, but a lot of people said fours, which was great. I just did this on a scale of one to five. Um, does this product match your style? That's a really ambiguous question. So a lot of people said threes, which I think is pretty great, um, but no one said five. It wasn't like someone's style is a bit metal pole. Um, so I probably could have made it prettier. Um, would you buy this product if you, if you saw it in the store? I was kind of expecting this. Um, it's, I think it's really cool, but it would need a, a little bit more improvement to, to be eye-catching in the store. So a lot of people said twos. Um, but then overall, is this product pretty? A lot of people said threes and fours, or uh, fours and fives, um, which I think is pretty great because I did put a lot of weight to it. <laughs> and then I uh, talked about like big improvements. Um, so the container obviously needs some work because it let out all the water in it. But, um, uh, so smaller holes on top just to create a, a little bit more of a pressure differential. Um, and then the base. I am not an expert welder. So when I made this, I did as good a job as I can, but it's not perfect. So it's a little bit wobbly. Um, it doesn't fall over, but it's a little bit wobbly. Um, I also wish I had centered the uh, hook over a, a, like a stronger part of the triangle um, just to make it a little bit more secure. Um, and if I were better at welding, I think I could have made the, made the base a little bit better. So I showed it to my expert, um, and she said that the height of the container might have a, a, an effect. So she's talking about this height from like the bottom of the container to where the plant goes, um, which I think is actually really interesting. I haven't thought of it at all. Um, so she said um, changing the heights, like making the uh, plant, or make the water rain um, taller, um, might change um, how affected the plants are by the, the, the thick or more um, And then adding platforms and candy canes would make it easier to cater to specific plants. Um, if I wanted to make this uh, hold more plants, I could just make more candy canes, and it would be kind of like that. And then you can just make more platforms and they can spin around just like that. And you can cater to a lot of different plants with a lot of specific needs. Um, and then I had to break down the cost. Um, keep in mind my budget was about uh, $9.51 and I went a little bit over that. Um, so the candy cane, um, also most of this uh, material I found in the um, shop. So I couldn't find the exact, like where we bought this exact uh, rod. But I did it the best I can. Um, the candy cane 
uh, the container. The container, I actually found the company that makes these containers, and if you buy them in bulk, they're only 76 cents, uh, which is far better than buying a lot of other time. <laughs> um, but in, in total, it came out to 18. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is true. This is true. Gelato is delicious. Um, so in total, it came out to 18.77, which is a little bit over budget, um, but it's a pretty cool product. Any questions?
I think it's fine. Uh, I'm, I'm just thinking like more, more in the middle. I, I don't know. I, I, I do see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 rocks and it gets all different sides of it so that it can you know, uh, smooth out the rocks. 
And I really like that because then I could get more sites of silver clean if it was moving different sites with uh, it with water. Um, and the same thing with electricity. So dishwasher cycles. Uh, there are two different types of dishwasher. There's a hot water dishwasher and there's a cold water dishwasher. The cold water dishwasher, uh, the cycles are up there. Um, it has a detergent cycle where it incorporates soap uh, and it gets all the grind and stuff off the silverware first. Uh, the rinse cycle, which then gets the, uh, the soap and all that access or all the residue off of it afterwards. And then the sanitation cycle, which kills the bacteria that's left over on the soap. And a hot, or a hot water dishwasher, um, it only has two cycles. It gets rid of that third sanitation cycle and just has the detergent cycle. And then because of the hot water, when it's 180 degrees or above, uh, it removes uh, bacteria from it. Although in restaurants it does require a hood to like remove all the food, so that is an actual thing that we have to put into it as a cost. Um, so for my design, I start off with a water drain test. You know, most uh, I didn't want to really have a pump or anything that I had to pump the water out of it. I kind of just wanted all the dirty water to go out because if the silver is just sitting in dirty water, it's not going to be clean. So um, up there you can see the water entered to the top, went through, and then it's going down to the bottom to the exit. Um, for my test, I put 100 milligrams of water in, and 100 milligrams of water came out in about five seconds. So I consider that a successful test to move forward and working on different parts of the design. So this is the design idea. Um, I call this my pathfinder. Um, I had a bunch of different ideas that I was kind of thinking of, but I couldn't really decide. So I decided to uh, kind of make up a mock version of the test with the two uh, Mountain Dew bottles. And um, I kind of really like the design. It, uh, I realized that inside the canister it could tumble the silverware just how I wanted to, to do it. Um, the motor turned it, and then later on the water could drain out from the side. I wouldn't really have to worry about anything. So this is my primary idea, and that's where I stuck to and started to work and develop on the main part. So the first part that I had to do was um, get rid of those two water bottles. They, they weren't great. So um, I moved on and started to make the canister out of PVC pipe. Um, PVC pipe is food safe so and, he or, and heavy duty so it could sustain a lot of force and um, it also worked really well because there's a lot of that around. So um, that was the main container of the body and then I started to work on how I was going to actually move the water inside of the system itself. So I started thinking of using a pipe because uh, that's how water usually travels and um, one thing I learned pretty early on is that plumbing is hard to so if I can leave that stationary, that would be best. So that's why I have this pipe right here that I was going to set in the middle of it inside the canister that would be stationary so that that canister could spin around with the silver. Um, and then I had to actually get the water inside of the canister. So I created this thing up here. I call it the water dispersal system. I've gone through like six different iterations. Um, and luckily, since I've been using 3D plastic, uh, it's been easy to do 3D plastic. is super easy because uh, you just wrap and prototype it. And, um, the only issue with it is that it's not perfectly watertight, so it, you know, it doesn't work out. You don't get 100% of the water usage, so it's good. if I were to manufacture the product, I'd probably injection mold that piece, definitely. But um, for testing purposes, it got the water on and uh, stayed inside the machine, so that's all that. So as you can see right here, I put the water dispersal system and pipe inside of the PVC pipe, and that really it showed that it worked. So then I started to work on actually keeping the silverware uh, inside the silverware and water inside the canister. So here I created two caps that would keep um, the silverware inside. And although those were also made out of uh, 3D printed plastic, so they aren't 100% watertight. So I knew I was expecting leaks, at least at the ends there, uh, if not anywhere else. And then this is also when I started to create the uh, the main body. Uh, the sand right here. Um, originally, I kind of had them sitting on two uh, like stands, which uh, kind of rolled back and forth. It wasn't super accurate. So then I created the uh, little holes here that were about the width, or I'm sorry, the diameter of the pipe, so that it could just spin and then there would be friction that held the pipe in place while the canister spun. Um, and then I started to think about the actual downslope angle that I talked about earlier. Um, so I created this leg to be shorter than the other leg so that um, the canister was moving downwards. And then I also uh, changed the motor mount to be slightly downwards too, so that the canister and the motor mount were parallel to each other. So the track that I put on later on would be straight and um, not like moving the canister back and forth, which could cause the motor mount to come on or some uh, part of it to break. So that's 
So as you can see here, this is what the full uh, version one that I made looked like. Um, the canister was on, it was able to connect, it spun properly, you know, without any issues. The only thing that I noticed is that the, uh, it was hard to assemble. Uh, using the canister, I had to slide it in the pipe, so it wasn't perfect and it was really hard to move. And I really didn't want this to be hard to clean, so I needed to, to change that up. So I then moved on to uh, making it easier to get the canister on. So that's when I decided to cut off the two parts up there. Um, they kind of so you can just place the canister and the pipe onto the tube at the same time and not have to worry about it. Um, with this, the pipes still are spun with the canister. So I had to add two clips right here that secured it in place and as well make sure that um, uh, the, the pipe didn't spin with the canister. So as you can see here, it's all connected. And then we move on to the canister uh, part. I added the holes so that the silver can actually get inside of the canister. And um, made it so that you, uh, I used a coupling as a door kind of mechanism uh, because couplings fit over pipes. I had to turn it down a little bit, but it wasn't super precise, so I, mean, I was expecting a little bit of water to come out of it. And um, as you can see here and here, I started to work on how the water was going to actually get inside of it. So I'm no expert plumber, so uh, my expert, Mr. Fletcher, he helped me out to get the water inside. Um, the, part, the way I was going to do is I was going to connect it up through an aerator and then move it through a laundry hose and then put it inside of the machine so that you know, it could use at a sink, which is probably in most kitchens. So that uh, really got the universal use part to work. And then uh, that's awesome. um, So as you can see here, it connects up to the laundry hose through an adapter that connects to the pipe. And then here's the aerator that connects up to the faucet. Uh, there are a few slight uh, changes between faucet and faucet, but as long as you can get an aerator adapter uh, to change, it's pretty much universal. So uh, one thing I did notice is that it was leaking. I kind of expected it to leak a little bit. So um, I had this major thing right here to make sure that I caught any water from the door and from outside here. But I didn't really have anything covered the motor now. So I had to create a motor, um, a motor shield is what I call it, so that the electronics weren't damaged. In a later version, I would like to move the motor mount away from uh, the splash zone so that it's just safer overall. But um, for the testing, this worked out pretty well. And then here's the test of the zone. So is the water that's coming out now water that was already put in it, or is, is the water on and it's running? The water's on and it's running, but that's why that was, that's dirty water coming out. As you can see, there's a little leaks there, there, and at the end there, a little bit there. That's just because it's really hard in the lab, especially to make anything that's so precise that it doesn't leak. So that, um, that's something I definitely want to improve on in the future, is how much water is possible. So um, moving on to the test. I started to really think about like how I could test the machine, and one thing I thought of was uh, the actual physical material that's on there, kind of like a saliva or like actual food particles left over. So what I wanted to use to test was olive oil, because if you've ever done dishes, it's really hard to get olive oil off. So um, I wanted to, and they all, both saliva and olive oil show up under a black light, so it's really easy to see what's actually there and what's gone. So um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to make it run for different time intervals, like 50 seconds, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, 60 seconds, and 75 seconds. Um, I just, my goal was to shoot for 60 seconds to be the perfect uh, time, but um, I wanted to see like how fast it would be able to clean the, the number up. And then after it came out of the machine, I ran off between 0 and 5, 0 being no fluorescent material left on it, and then 5 being the maximum amount, like the same amount of so this is the first one before it entered into the silverware dishwasher. Um, as you can see, there's a, definitely a lot of fluorescent material on it. But then after the runtime, you can see most of it came off, with the exceptions of a little bit there. Um, for a first test, I definitely saw that as a success. Although later on, you can notice that in this test, um, same type of thing, there's a lot of fluorescent material. And then there's still a lot of fluorescent material. I definitely would really want to have a dinner with that. So um, the thing I did notice with that is that 
with the test that I did, I hadn't properly cleaned the subware in between each running. So I believe that uh, it increasingly built up from the previous test, so it wasn't really accurate about how it was actually cleaned. So as you can see here, that first one, there's the parabola forming, which we don't want. And then for the other test, it was more of a linear curve, kind of capping out at 60 seconds. And then for the other two tests I ran, it was about the same, or it was capping out at 60 seconds. Um, so overall, I believe Ritz part of removing the water, or I'm sorry, removing the back, not bacteria, the material from the uh, silverware was successful. So design cost. Um, luckily for me, dishwashers are very expensive. Uh, on the low side, they're between $10,000. On the high side, they're up to $40,000. Um, for this one, or for something of this caliber of just washing silverware, I believe it would cost about $2,000 as like a price range for actually marketing it. But um, this prototype only cost $135. But there are definitely some things that um, I missed out on this version that would need to be incorporated into a final design, such as um, detergent being added to it and sanitizer being added to it, along with foot costs if you wanted to remove the sanitizer. So future plans, I really want to reduce the water loss. That really bugs me about how much was being spilled all over the place. Um, that I really want. Um, I really want to expand the size. Although I believe that this product could hold 10 rolls of silverware, I think a bigger version could be better and be even uh, more like working and remove the uh, bottleneck even further and have uh, you know, more silverware can be run. Uh, I wanted to create an off-grid version. Um, over the last couple of years, I've worked at off-grid wedding events, so they haven't and then we run out of silverware. So the process is we have to take the silverware back to the restaurant, get it cleaned there, and bring it back. It's a, it's a big hassle, especially if someone's looking for a fork. Um, so I would really like to create an off-grid version that doesn't need to have electricity or running water, just so that you don't have to bring it back. Um, I really want to expand to cold water use, um, because that is what most dishwashers use uh, in restaurants, is cold water, and it's also less expensive overall than not having to run hot water short. Uh, I want to make it more user friendly. Currently, you need to be kind of actively thinking about it to have it work effectively. And I really wanted to get it down to just be a push of a button, it ran, and then it stopped. The dishwasher would remove it and bring it up to the front. Um, any questions? Out of a commercial washer, you're dry? Uh, no, they are not dry. So they 
in most restaurants they're hand polished by the staff so that you know you get a little bit of water left on it. So it does, this doesn't really deal with the problem of hand washing or I'm sorry, polishing it. It's more of just making sure it's clean and right. Yes. Um, so typically in a restaurant right now, how is the silverware washed as opposed to the dishes? Um, it's so. About, uh, at least in our restaurant that I've worked in, about 80% of the silverware has to be put into one of the, a big like, crate type of thing. It's moved in, uh, you close the hatch, and then it washes for about five minutes. Um, the whole issue with it is that uh, it just takes a lot of time to gather it all up when it could be just running constantly and just be right there. Yeah. So that's kind of that. But so currently silverware is washed separately from the dishes? Yeah, it can't really be washed separately. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Al. Uh, 
what stint you do and what you know at what time it is because you know if you feel any sort of stress it can uh, lead to stints. Um, sorry. Uh, but you know, since can be anything uh, physical. Uh, there's two kind of differentiations that I've made for stims. I've seen physical stims and verbal stims, and because I'm autistic, I've done both. <laughs> um, stimming for everyone is a little bit different. Um, I'm my project is mostly uh, focusing on verbal stims. Uh, which is those like repetition of words or sounds to uh, help refocus and re uh, like calm down stress, like make people de stress kind of thing. But there's also physical stems. Um, examples are things like uh, handshaking. Uh, if you've ever like are have ever like kind of knee bounce or uh, quick to pen. That's also uh, examples of stimming. Although the different the differentiation of uh, stims for normal for uh, in the community of uh, neurotypical people, which is people who obviously do not have a neurological disorder like um, autistic spectrum disorder or anything of the sort, like Tourette's or whatever, people who process information normally, quotation marks, um, and there are diverted people, which include people with Tourette's and autism and all the sorts of other um, disorders that there are out there. Um, but stints can be just basically done by anyone, as you can tell. You've seen people who uh, shake their leg when they're strapped or with the pen. The different, uh, differentiation is that autistic stems tend to be a little bit more, um, uh, not as ex widely as accepted because they are a little bit more extreme. Um, common physical autistic stems include like handshaking, uh, rocking, spinning, and they can tend to be very distracting in their working and learning environment. So, um, same with verbal stimming, which is, um, you know, repetition of words and talking out loud. Sometimes it's really hard to um, come, uh, kind of keep that under wraps and not disturb other people because when you start talking and repeating words, especially out loud, it can get very distracting for others in the, in the, in the city. So, my product is to help kind of allow people to verbally stim and to hear those sounds and to have like that common repetition of specific sounds um, without having to disrupt others by just you know putting it uh, in their ear and just listening to it. Um, this is a big huge problem because one in 59 people U.S. have autism spectrum disorder. Um, it's also just a big, huge problem, especially for me, because I deal with this on a semi-regular basis, especially recently with COVID and high stress situations, uh, like uh, testing and you know, your senior year, very high stress situations. This EDD presentation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, this is, I don't know if you can tell right now, but my knee is bobbing right now. <laughs> trying to kind of keep it under control, um, which keeping stims under control is very hard, very um, not healthy, because it's sort of like, if you shake up a bottle of like soda, that's like what the stress is doing. It's uh, making you feel like a little unstable and kind of uh, just overwhelmed. Um, Sensors are a way to kind of release that stress, like uh, slowly opening the bottle lid without, you know, 
an explosion because those things happen. Um, when you kind of don't have an outlet for them, they tend to overwhelm you, and when they overwhelm you, you tend to not be able to learn. Um, so the only two kind of uh, the solutions that I found for stimming um, uh, previously, or like as of now, uh, have been either change vocal stims to physical stims because physical stims are easier to hide or easier to kind of um, keep minimalist, while as verbal stims are out loud and can be very distracting, uh, or suppressing them completely, which is very unhealthy for the person because if you've ever tried to model stress, it is so annoying and very, like, um, do actual physical harm on the body um, because you kind of clench and think you make your heart kind of, um, I personally feel a lot of stress in my vocal cords, so oftentimes when I get stressed, I don't, I have nonverbal moments where I cannot speak at all. So this is a big, huge problem for me, so I wanted to find a solution. So my client is staying at the school district or any school district because I wanted this to be able to be used in school. Where people tend to be high stress, especially you know high school. Um, and also, as a, as a child, I didn't really have a whole lot of uh, I had ways to kind of control that stress that I had in social situations, but I kind of wanted to kind of more explore to, I was always taught as a child to kind of keep it contained. Um, and so I kind of wanted to have it be able to be used by children over the age of six because um, I thought you know, if my younger self had something like this where I could just listen to music and, well, not music, but sounds, repetitive sounds, um, I, I felt a lot better and I would have, it would have been a nice way to kind of relieve stress without people noticing too much. Um, so obviously my design statement was to design a product or computer program because at the beginning of this, um, of making, I was not sure if I wanted a physical object that you could hold or if I wanted a program that could be used on a computer, or like any type of computer, or if I wanted like a little, um, little device to play it on because um, that would have been, you know, a nice piece of hardware that, you know, the administrative or school could give children um, so they can use it more easily. Um, and I most certainly did not want to, if it was a product, I didn't want to have small pieces because of choking hazards and uh, because I wanted to be used to, for age six now. I also wanted it to be very simple for that particular reason. Uh, and I did not want it to disrupt the learning or working environment that they are in because um, <laughs> as much as it's annoying to feel stressed and not be able to express it, it's also annoying for others when that kind of release of stress is loud and disrupting to them. Um, so this is my basic program, at least in the beginning. Uh, I went through an iteration. This is the first version of it. Um, I made this on Make Code Arcade, which is a um, attachment on Google, which you can basically make your own like, little mini game or program. Uh, pretty easily, actually. They, um, I started off using blocks, uh, block coding, which is basically you take block and you move it, and it gives you like a set of instructions, and you just kind of pull blocks into it, and it makes the program work. So this is the first kind of look of what the game looked like, or what Stimbank looked like at the very beginning. So you have all these icons, and when you hover over the icons, they make a specific sound so that's linked to them. And when you <coughs> do not want them to play sound, you just kind of move this character, which um, oddly, which um, I specifically made a rainbow infinity symbol because uh, rainbow infinity symbol is the 
uh, pride symbol for, aut for the autistic spectrum community. So I kind of wanted to have that be a kind of uh, interesting thing. So this is how. Ah, this one, this first one, sorry. So this is kind of how my game worked at the very beginning. Um, since then, I've cut out a lot of this kind of intro thing. Uh, also on the encoder page, um, they give you like a little bit of a, uh, they make it look like a console. So in case you want to add hardware to it, you are allowed, you make it kind of specifically made for hardware, but you do not have to have enough hardware. You could actually have it as a program. And yeah, you're hearing this just lots of talking because I recorded this during class. <laughs> So this is just me running through all the, the sounds and icons. There's one. Some of them are very quiet now. I tried to make the icons take the level of the sound. So what was the text that was scrolling down in the beginning? Uh, that was a little bit of an intro that I had in my original program um, that I later cut out because I thought, like, you know, in a high stress situation, you really don't want to be having to read through that every single time you start the program. So I added that, you know, chunk of information um, to a button, to so the B button, and it rolls through kind of like how you use the game even though it's kind of self-explanatory and simple. Um, and it's now beginning is just like a little um, saying like, press the B button for an explanation of how to, how to use it. So that's now an optional thing that they don't have to actually put it through. Ah, whoops. So this is kind of what the program looks like now because the first iteration was me just placing them on a kind of a coordinate grid, and this is now a column, like a, a tile map, is what they called it. So all of these, all of these icons that have been placed in a specific location, like 75, comma, like a y and x coordinate, they're actually put into columns. So this is column two, this is column like four, six, all the way through, and I kind of disperse them out, kind of. Uh, fashion because I wanted it to look at least a little except, exactly pleasing. Um, right now it's kind of in quadrants and really weird looking quadrants because when I took, I couldn't take a picture of the full screen like I could with the original version. I had to actually put them together. I took four screenshots and had to put them together in a specific order to make them so you can see the whole map at once. So this is the link to the final program. Um, that you can just press because I published it. As you can see, if you need help, press the B button. And as you go through, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. you can go through all the kind of sounds. And they're kind of in a nice pathway, so you can kind of follow the path to find all of them. There's one stand here as well.
filters to it, so it's just like a pair, pair to make it like really squeaky. Uh, you can make a harmony. This is a trumpet, so it's, you make the sound of like your trumpet, which is a little bit interesting, especially if you're saying words. Uh, and you can say it, you can put a filter on it as you're, as you're talking to a fan. Uh, you can also raise and lower the pitch on this version, way slower, way faster, which originally I wanted to do with my program um, because I wanted to add your own, have, have the ability to add your own sounds to it because, you know, the nice sounds that they had, the nice sounds that they had on the original program were nice and I really liked them, but um, I wanted it to be more customizable, unfortunately. Um, I did not have the necessary programming skills to do that at this point. I had kind of an idea of how to, once you import an audio, how to play it on a loop and kind of set to an array because I did take coding classes during this. Most certainly a learning curve because I did not know how to program before this. Um, so this is how I'm making the sprite looks. So basically in the program, let the sprite, let is a, make it a variable, name the variable, create the image, and I chose the coin because it's the most simple icon. And it actually, interestingly enough, uses numbers as like the colors. And I named this, um, this icon named the Bing because the audio used for it is labeled the Bing uh, program. It also places it on a tile location. This is second column, second row. And that's where it is in the program. Uh, and the editor on how I actually made it, because I didn't make it from the JavaScript program, I actually made it in this kind of gallery thing. So you have like a pencil to make lines, eraser, you can make squares, rectangles, circles, building color, lines. These are the colors that they got available. So this is for the audio link to Sprite. This is just the programming that was that allows, you know, when you when the player, which is the little infinity symbol, hovers over another character, like the coin icon, it plays that sound until you step off of it. So what I was doing is I was also thinking about, you know, potentially having hardware for this, unfortunately. Um, none of the hardware I quite liked and I thought fit with this program. So I decided to just leave it as a computer program. But that also, you know, makes it more available and accessible to others instead of having to, you know, buy the hardware and then play it. So these are just a bunch of ways on which we thought we could add audio to my game like add your own audio, but unfortunately because of whatever reason it just would not let me add audio, which and as I further my learning of coding, I hope to someday <laughs> be able to have it so you add your own audio. Once I added the audio, I tried to record my own audio to put into that using these steps and none of them worked. But if you ever want to record audio, this is a free site. You can go on to Google. It's really easy to use. I quite liked it. So what I wanted to add to the base code, which um, was to what the audio was recorded to put into an array. And so when you added a new audio, you know, the audio would automatically be put into a, uh, an array, which assigned it to a place in the grid by adding icons um, and adding a sprite to it, which would have been like a normal, you know, probably like a, a stop sign looking kind of thing, like a recording uh, sprite and not make it too fancy, but just like a little recording. Uh, this is just a kind of basic when I was learning how to code. This was the array example that I Um, original testing concept, I actually wanted autistic people to test my product. Unfortunately, because of you know, 
know, confidentiality, confidentiality laws, I did not have that um, group of people be able to test them um, because obviously I can't know who tested them or, you know, all of the things <laughs> um, because that would be confidentiality. So I wanted to just kind of like pose it to Mr. Fouchette, which is, who is the school psychologist, and ask, you know, if he could just recommend it to people who knew uh, were autistic or, you know, had Tourette's. Because people with Tourette's could also use this. Uh, people who, even like, just kind of anyone can use this if it helps them relieve stress by having uh, repeated audio. But unfortunately, I was not allowed to do that because of that. So this is kind of the original form that I had for the testing, which is just kind of they went to school and had a normal day. And they would use the program throughout the day. Um, whenever they felt stressed, they would record the, the time. Uh, they would record the time of feeling stressed, the time of using stim bank, and time of using stim bank because I wanted to know how you know how long it took them to relax. Um, what sound was used because I thought it would be interesting. Uh, to, <laughs> to just know what sound it was because I kind of wanted to do, um, kind of just wanted to know. I think it was the little question to do. Um, did they feel less stressed after using the sound? Were they able to refocus after using the sound? Uh, were they able to focus while using the sound? And were they able to resume learning after using it? Because I wanted it to be like a contemporary thing that they did. So that uh, the repetitive sound would help them calm down that if they were stressed during you know, learning like a lesson or whatever, um, they would be able to regain focus and continue lesson without having to leave the classroom because that is an issue that I do. Sometimes I have to leave the room. Um, edited testing, I built, I made a Google form and it kind of posted to, ed, to anyone, it was open to anyone, just kind of what sound they would like to use, uh, what sound they like to use, uh, did they find it calming to use the system? Uh, I think, yeah. And if they had any suggestions on what could be improved on the game. Um, also, I did not have a professional, unlike everyone else, because um, I you know, talked to a bunch of people, including actually autistic TikToks, uh, who is a person on YouTube that I follow. Not on YouTube, Instagram, sorry. Um, she actually posts, they actually post a bunch of, you know, informational uh, kind of, they post TikToks or kind of uh, content from autistic creators, um, which I always enjoy because uh, it makes me feel like I'm not alone. <laughs> because, uh, you know, when a lot of my classmates, my friends, you know, are not autistic as well, it kind of makes them feel alone. So seeing content creators um, talk about kind of autistic issues and um, how they feel is always really interesting. But they also, on the on that Instagram site, they also post like informational kind of little tidbits. It's how I learned a lot about autistic swimming and because beforehand I knew nothing about it. I just knew I liked repetitive uh, Ian Dickerson was a friend of mine who I knew went to computer science college, but because he was a student, uh, he did not qualify as a professional. And Tom and Andrew Allen are my cousins. Um, I was obviously not looking for them to be a professional, but if they knew anyone who you know, could help me with JavaScript and help you know, be able to input audio into my game, I asked them. All right, questions? Loving this, but loving it too much. <laughs> <laughs> 